on today's story beat what were the things that you mostly learned from fred rogers i think what i learned from him in terms of the production was the child comes first no matter what we do in this program the child comes first and that means being respectful because they're not just little adults they have their own ideas, their own thoughts, and everything is valid. And so you can you can translate that into humanity as well. But that you know, it was his mission, really, <laughs> to help kids feel good about themselves and to help them understand the world. This is Story Beat with Steve Cuden, a podcast for the creative mind. Story Beat explores how masters of creativity develop and produce brilliant works that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuden. Thanks for joining us on Story Beat. We're coming to you from the Steel City, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My guest today, Margie Whitmer produced the beloved TV series, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, for many years. After production ended in 2001, she continued on with Fred Rogers Productions, producing live action segments for Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood through the end of 2018, after which she remained a script consultant on the show through season six. Over the years, Margie has also been the liaison for Fred Rogers Productions to PBS's Ready to Learn initiative. She co-created, wrote, and produced video-based early childhood professional development workshop materials, and she was the project director for two series of picture books, First Experiences and Let's Talk About It. She's held production and administrative positions at WQED-TV for both local and national programs, including the Once Upon a Classic series and National Geographic specials. Margie has served on the board of the Women's Center and Shelter of Greater Pittsburgh, ultimately as board president. She's been a volunteer reader for Read Together and a steering committee member for Empty Bowls, which is an annual fundraising event for the Greater Pittsburgh Food Bank to raise hunger awareness. She's currently a reader and board president for Reading Ready Pittsburgh, a nonprofit encouraging family engagement and early literacy through reading for children up to the age of five. So for all of those reasons and many more, it's my great honor and true privilege to be joined on Storybeat today by the extraordinary producer, Margie Whitmer. Margie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. Oh, well, the pleasure is all mine. Trust me. So let's go back in history just a little bit. Where in your life, at what point did you first think to yourself that you were interested in being in the world of TV production or in the entertainment industry? When did that bug first bite you? Wow, it's really hard to tell. But when I was a kid, I used to, every summer, I would put on puppet shows. I, would, I wasn't the talent, I wasn't anything, but I made the tickets, I set up the chairs, I got the candy to sell to the adults. And then my friends, Mike Gaylor and Jack Walker would do the puppet show. Tommy Spence. And and so, I mean, that's kind of the, the, what I remember doing. And you and, then, and you produced those. You weren't in them. No, I was never in them. And so, yeah, I guess I produced them. I mean, they made up the stories and who knows what those stories were. They were probably five minutes long. Then I got really interested in kids. And somewhere in my college career, I did a lot of child development and student teaching. And, and I was I was certified to be a teacher. But I couldn't find a teaching job. And so at one point when I was in college, I did an internship at WGBH for the a show called Zoom. And I basically worked in the mailroom. I didn't and the idea with Zoom was kids would send in their ideas for the show. And then we would go through the mail and give them to the producer. So I was doing that because I I would um I had to work on a senior project. And of course, we didn't start the senior project until January of senior year. And my friend who I was working on it with was going to be in Boston. And so Zoom was produced in Boston. Anyway, I couldn't find a teaching job, but I also was a nanny when I was in college. And the, the um, mother said, hey, why don't you go down to WQED? They're always looking for people. And I said, but I don't know anything about television. She said, oh, just tell them you worked at Zoom. <laughs> so I went down and I interviewed and I took a typing test and it was so bad. 
that the, the secretary said, well, Mr. Skinner, who was the uh, executive vice president of the company, comes out to interview her. I'll just tell him we didn't have time. And I said, okay, fine. Because you know what? She said, if you know how to type, that's all you're going to get to do. So anyway, they hired me. <laughs> and so I worked at QED on and off for about a year freelance. And, and, you, were, then, and you were what? You were in your early 20s at that point? Yeah, I just graduated college. And you and, had a, already had a background in childhood education, yes? Yeah, but I, I, couldn't, I didn't get a teaching job. So anyway, um, I worked on and off for them. And um, then this op then they hired me full time at QED. So Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood was being produced. It actually was out of production for five years from 1975 to 1979. So when I started, they were just winding down. So I saw Mr. Rogers in the hall and he had his offices down the hall from mine. I kind of knew who he was. I was too old when the show started and I thought it was kind of jerky, kind of uh. So um, <laughs> then what happened was when Fred started back in production in 1979, they decided to do theme weeks. So the, there would be five episodes. The story would play out over those five episodes. And, those, and, and so they would do three of those theme weeks a year. And then they would add those to the collection. So there was, you know, there was an art, there's an archive now of like 800, 900 Mr. Rogers neighborhoods. Right. So the kickoff, they wanted to do this big primetime special in Studio A at WQED with questions from the audience, Collins, it, and it was about going to school and how to prepare your kid for school. Susan Stamberg was there, was one of the hosts, and it was with Fred. And they needed somebody to pull it together. And at the time I was doing these call-in shows for WQED, we used to call them disease of the month, like adoption, you know, pros and cons. So they said, Hey, why don't you call Marty? She does one every month. So I walked down the hall and did some freelance work for them producing this. And then I, I, I met, I really met Fred and I really started to understand who he was. And I remember after that saying to myself, you know, if I ever get a chance to work on that show, I think I'd really like it. And it was one of those went through my head and I didn't think about it again until a colleague of mine who had worked at QED went down the hall and worked, started working for Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And they said, you know, Margie, we're looking for a producer. And um, he said, I was wondering what your friend so-and-so, I won't mention names here, is doing. Could I have her number? And I said, yeah, sure. And when I hung up, my mind I said, wait a minute, I want to audition for that job, or I want to interview for that job. And so I called him back and I said, Sam, can I uh, interview for the job? And he said, yeah, but you're a producer now. We're looking for an associate producer. And I said, Sam, I do studio shows. I never get to go out and do anything. Why don't you um, let me do it? And so what happened was then I didn't even have an interview because I worked on that other, that other show for them. And so Sam called me like a week later and said, um, you have the job if you want it. <laughs> So, oh, wow. so I so, left this full time job at QED and went and freelance for Mr. Rogers. So you did you didn't train anywhere to be a producer. You learned how to be a producer no. on the job. Yeah, I mean, I walked in after that typing test. After I failed that typing test, that's when I got this job. I mean, hmm. I didn't know the difference between film and videotape. I thought they were all the same thing. Huh. So, so did you look up to anyone aside from Mr. Rogers, obviously, who was sort of already deeply in it? Was there anyone that you then started to study as to how do you produce a show or did you just wing it? I just winged it. And, that and I, mean, I was really interested in kids and some of the child development stuff that I had learned in college came back to me. And I think of all, you know, I always used to play school teacher when I was a kid too. So that I think those things subconsciously came together in my brain because I never, I never thought I'd be in television. But it would certainly it certainly had to have helped you that you had a background in childhood education to be then working for Mr. Rogers, which was about childhood education. Right. And I also think, and, and this is just really instinctively, there is this phrase that a quote that Fred has that I saw somewhere, and I don't know that I ever heard him say it, but he said, and I have to think about how to say it because it's a play on words. The child is still in me, but sometimes not so still. And I remember thinking about that and, and how we all think we remember what childhood was like, but mostly we don't ever remember things under four and we tend to be nostalgic about it. And it's not really, you know, it's a little 
it's not always very objective, that we forget the kids don't know everything. We forget the kids need to have things explained to them, that what's appropriate for a seven-year-old is not appropriate for a three-year-old. Mm -hmm. You know, that kids, kid, the whole world is open to kids and it can be scary, but it can also be wonderful. What I remember mostly from being a small child is a sense of things, but not too many specific details, a feeling. And that was kind of Fred's goal is to is to help kids connect the dots about the world around them. Again, this was something that you understood from your from your actual education, not from your on the job education. It was still left inside of me as a person. You know, I think I'm more in, I'm pretty instinctive as opposed to there are things that I will see that I don't ha I don't know this the childhood the child development theory behind them, but I would just say, Fred, that's not right, is it? Or, or our, our consultants, I'd say, that doesn't seem right to me. What, what, why isn't it? And then they would tell, well, here's why, Margie, because blah, blah, blah. It was a gut feeling a lot of times. And was that the same for you in terms of how you eventually grew into being an effective producer? I'm going to assume that your first foray as producing Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, you probably ran into all sorts of issues you didn't understand how to do, and that over time you got better at it, yes? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it was just a lot listening and paying attention to him and kind of looking at the people in the office who'd been there for a while. Because, I mean, Mr. Rogers was like, Hotel California, you don't leave. <laughs> you know, <laughs> People, only in a good way, <laughs> but um, it, you know that that I really respected all these people around me. But what point did you think to yourself? You know what? I am pretty good at doing this. For it to really kind of come to the surface, I went through the motions. I think, and then I learned. I, you know, I just listened and learned and absorbed it. What What uh, would you say that you learned from him that has remained with you to this day or was very important in terms of your, your growth as a producer and so on, or even as a human? What were the things that you mostly learned from Fred Rogers? I think what I learned from him in terms of the production was the child comes first. No matter what we do in this program, the child comes first. And that means being respectful because they're not just little adults. They have their own ideas, their own thoughts, and everything is valid. And so you can you can translate that into humanity as well. But that, you know, it was his mission, really, <laughs> to help kids feel good about themselves and to help them understand the world. And so it's about a bunch of different things that all connect. Respect. Respect is really one of the big ones. And empathy. Was was he as um, magical a human being as we're all now led to think of him? I think most people think of him as being magical in some way. Was he magical in person? Well, he was the same person. He wasn't acting, but he worked really hard at what he did. You know, mm -hmm. it wasn't it didn't come easily. He wasn't magic. He was human, just like the rest of us. He got mad. He made mistakes. He worked and worked and worked at it. And I think that, you know, I think Fred's parents were very strict. And he grew up at a time when children are seen and not heard. And anger was not something you expressed. And so I think that a lot of his work was him still trying to figure that out and deal with it. He didn't want kids to, I mean, he didn't have a horrible childhood. Don't get me wrong. But I think he really wanted to help kids understand that they are valuable, that they have things to say, too, even though they're three and four and five and six years old. I, I think what if, I, if I'm interpreting you correctly, you're basically saying that he was really, truly human and he had a human upbringing like everyone else. Exactly. Thank you. That's a very good way to put it. All right. So on the show... What were your primary day-to-day -day responsibilities? What did you do as the producer of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood? Okay. The bottom line is make it happen <laughs> or not. <laughs> so when I started, we were doing three new weeks of programs a year. And they would each have their own theme. And a story would be played out over those five days. And we would tape in the fall, in the early spring, and then in the late spring. And so in the summertime, Fred would go and write the scripts for the first week. But before that, in say June, we would have a production meeting and we would give him ideas for what the themes might be. And a lot of times he had his own ideas. 
but we would have the meetings, we'd kind of hash it out. And he'd walk away and he'd pick three. And then he'd come back and he'd start writing the first week while he was away. But what we did at those meetings is uh, when we talked about the themes, then we would also kind of bring ideas about how to translate those themes into uh, a, a TV show. And so maybe it would be a special guest or maybe it would, you know, each show had a, the neighborhood of make-believe segments. He would write that story. What is the story? What are the stories behind these themes? And maybe, um, you know, we think about special guests or, or I had this box under my desk. It was this ratty old cardboard box. And we would get fan mail and people would say, my nephew, twirl, you know, she's a baton twirl and she twirls fire. Or, you know, uh, we get all these different kinds of things. And I would write them a letter and say, okay, well, thank you. We'll, we'll keep you in mind. But sometimes there would be something that I really liked that I thought Fred would go for. So at this meeting, I'd bring it up. I'd bring the box and some of the things that I picked from it. But he would go away and let's say write the first week of scripts over the summer. And we'd get them over um, Labor Day. And so I we do a table read to just kind of see how long the segments might be. And then I'd look at it and analyze it to see what he wanted. Okay, where are we going to play some find somebody who can play the saw? Or where where can we find a place where we can show kids how people make crayons or balls or you know ice cream? And so then that time between September and our studio time in November, that's the time we would have weekly production meetings with the art crew. To, to look at props, you know, if we needed to have new props, if we needed to make a new set or, you know, that kind of stuff. In the meantime, we'd be shooting either, like if Fred was going to visit Yo-Yo Ma, we'd be shooting that or we'd be shooting, you know, the ice cream factory. And those would be all edited together. <laughs> and so doing that table read kind of allowed us to give it a, basically how long each segment was going to be. Did you or anyone else ever contribute to what those story ideas were going to be for that, for that period? Or was it entirely Mr. Rogers? Um, it was pretty much him. You know, I mean, we would tell him the situation and, and he used to every week have this meeting with a woman named Dr. Margaret McFarland, who was this kind of our chief con consultant. And, and she was um, a professor at, University of Pittsburgh when Fred first got out of uh, seminary, I'm sorry, when he first got out of college and he decided he wanted to go into tele children's television. And they said to him, you really need to work with Dr. Margaret McFarland because she is one of the experts in the country. And it was actually at that time, it was in the Pitt Med School of Medicine. It was, it was kind of combined in there, but she worked with a very famous person named Eric Erickson. And so Fred, Fred studied under her. He never really got a, de a degree in child development, but he spent a lot of time with kids and he kind of grew to, to know how their little brains work. And he really, he really tuned into it. And so he would meet with her and, and consult on these scripts. And she would say, well, you know, Fred, and then she would tell him some story. It always would start out with, I knew a family once who had a child that did this. And so... <laughs> From that story, then he would maybe weave into the neighborhood of make believe a story that that would tell kind of different facets of this particular theme, like divorce. We did a piece about a kid going on an airplane because when parents get divorced and the parent lives someplace else or moves away, the kid has you know the kids. What happens when you get on the airplane? You have to you have to fly by yourself. Who takes care of you? Where's the bathroom? Those kinds of concerns. But we also did a film about Mr. and Mrs. McFeely and when they got married and how Mr. McFeely shows up and Fred says, well, we're talking about divorce today. But, and David gets all nervous. He said, oh, I remember when Betsy and I got married and then it's kind of, and you see this wonderful film. And, and so, it, you know, I wouldn't have ever thought of having a film about an airplane, you know, a kid's going on an airplane, so that he would kind of explore all these different options. And then the story make-believe would be, you know, well, parents can get mad and angry with each other, but that doesn't mean they're necessarily going to get divorced. 
but you also have to know that divorce is pretty permanent. And one little boy said, oh, I know what a permanent is. My mom gets one in her hair every month. <laughs> you know, we forget <laughs> they can't, that some of our, a lot of our words in our language have different meanings. <laughs> well, English is a very difficult language to master. Yeah, yeah. But, w w would you say that he, Fred Rogers' ability to communicate not only with kids, but with adults as well, was that level of respect that he showed to everyone? Was that his secret? Well, I don't know if it was a secret, but, you know, parents would watch with their kids. And, and he hoped that that was the secret. He hoped that the parents would sit down and watch the show with their kids. Because, you know, he was talking to the parents, too, but um, in a way that the kids understood as well. So as a producer, do you think of yourself, when you were producing the shows, do you think of yourself as, as a storyteller? Really? Because I didn't write the stories. You know, I contributed to them and I, I weighed in on them. But, you know, ultimately, even if I thought my ideas were good, Fred had the final say because one director said to me, Margie, it's not your neighborhood. Whose neighborhood is it? <laughs> so, I mean, you know, I got plenty of encouragement and, and, and he gave me a lot of uh, help to raise my self-esteem as a human being and as an adult. But, you know, he was so gentle with his criticisms that <laughs> you were okay. I find it very hard to imagine Mr. Rogers berating someone in a very harsh way. That just yeah. doesn't seem to compute. Yeah, he never, I never heard him. You know, if things were going wrong in the studio and he was angry, he never yelled at anybody. He was mostly angry at the situation. Or, you know, he didn't blame any one person generally. And I know that he's pulled, he pulled me aside a couple of times and said, you've got to fix this. You know, we got to get this fixed because blah, blah, blah. But it was never in front of the whole crew. That would never have happened. No, he practiced what he preached. Yes? Yeah. And I, like I said, he worked hard. He really did. Well, I think that's evident from the results that he did work hard. It wasn't, he didn't slough it off. He you, he looked like someone who really put some effort into what he did. And obviously he did. Would you say that there are any producers that you admired back then who weren't involved either in WQED or uh, with you know Mr. Rogers Neighborhood? Were there any producers you admired and looked up to? Well, the, the woman who gave me my first job at QED was this, this extraordinary documentary filmmaker named Virginia Bartlett. And she was in Pittsburgh for a long time. She she moved soon out, a few years after I had worked for her. But I kept in touch with her over the years. And I don't know, she just inspired me in a lot of ways. So let's talk about Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood for a moment. Uh, you transitioned okay. from the end of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood into Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, correct? Yeah. And what did your responsibilities remain essentially the same or did it change for you? No, it was very different. Television is made very differently now than it was when we were coming up. And so the scripts were written in New York. Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood became a much bigger production. Um, it was, it's animated. It's done in Canada. It has many, many more people involved. And so um, my job with Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood was twofold. I helped produce these little two-minute pieces, one and a half two-minute pieces. They were live action pieces that would come in the middle between two 11-minute segments. It was an interstitial. Yes. And so there would be one after the first 11-minute piece, animated piece, and then there would be one after the second animated piece. And then the show would be over. So, so that Daniel Cyber's neighborhood has two stories based on a theme, two 11 minute stories based on a theme, and then two interstitials that tie in in some way, not all of them tie in in a real tight, specific, obvious, concrete way. Did you write those interstitials as well? Um, yeah. I mean, I would come up with some of the ideas we had the the other two producers would do it. It was kind of a, a group effort. It just changed over the years. And were you producing those here in Pittsburgh? No, they were done here or around. Like we went over to Stroudsburg to the railroad or, you know, but but I mean, we didn't go far away necessarily. What were some of the biggest challenges that you've had to overcome while you were putting those shows together? What were the production challenges that you went through? I think that you that, that you have to learn to, to think on your feet. And in one situation, this was for Daniel. 
we were at the airport and we were doing a, a piece about going on an airplane and we wanted to get a shot of the, the plane taking off and going into the sky. Right. And I don't remember exactly what the situation was, but there was some mess up from one of the other crew members that that was not taken care of, that that shot was not put together. So the people that used to own this house, the husband was an air traffic controller and he'd retired, but I had their, I had their old phone number. We've been keeping, we've been friends. And I called him. I said, Larry, here's the deal. Can you call somebody and tell me when there's, a, um, I think I went in Southwest because it didn't have a big logo. So they're getting over the logo problem. I said, can you tell me when there's one taking off? Could they, can they give you that information? So I'm on the phone. I'm there. Okay. Get the cameraman out there and let's just do this. I'll tell you when there's going to be two different ones taking off. Be ready to get both of them. I know. And, and it was the end of the day. It was a Saturday. It was like Easter weekend or something. So, and these people, the other part of the crew had to get their mega bus back to New York because they had to shoot. So, you know, you just kind of um, have to be ready in the moment to um, be prepared. When we took the show to Russia and I had this translator who, who was worked for National Geographic and she was with us. And so we get to the hotel in Moscow and they they take all of they took all of our passports and they said, we'll give them back to you later. And, and we have to look at them. You can pick them up, I guess, the next day. I said, I said, Masha, is this right? And she said, yeah, don't worry about it. But you have to pay. And so uh, I, I this was back when there was something called telexes. And I said, telexes back and forth with Russia saying, can you use a MasterCard? Can you do this? Blah, blah, blah. Right. But I also had five thousand dollars cash with me. We get to the hotel and I had th this giant hotel and I had to pay at they had this bank in the hotel. So I went over to the bank at lunchtime and they they, they said, well, we take MasterCard, but we don't have the slips. You know, they used to have these slips that they'd run through a machine. Come back at midnight. I'm like, what? And Matt Marsha said, yeah, that's what he said. Oh, so I went down, I'm telling you, I, I had my pajamas on with an overcoat on and I'm standing there and, you know, they said, well, we, we won't, what she said, what Masha said to me earlier was, don't give them any money. We tell them you don't have any money and that you have to use your credit card. And I was like, oh my God. And I said, I don't have any money. I have to use my credit card. So anyway, <laughs> so I went back. So there was eight of us on the crew. Now you think they would just do one sheet for all of us because we're all together. No, no, no. I was standing there as they went through everybody's passport, everybody, you know, and I went back at midnight and they had, they had this, the sheets I needed and they did, they did all nine of us. And then I went back to bed. <laughs> so so that, you're describing something that had to have been both nerve wracking and pressure packed. Yeah. What is your secret, if you have one or your technique for handling pressure when you're under it like that? Do you have in a psychological way of thinking about things? Do you think about <laughs> something peaceful? What do you do to deal with pressure? You know, I think that I just am in the moment. It's like, okay, here's the situation. We need to solve this right now. So what's the fastest thing we can do and the most efficient thing? You know, let's say we were in the studio, the air conditioning goes off. So we can't, we can't continue taping. It's like, Okay, everybody just go back to your desk, go back to, you know, go back to the art room, go upstairs, do some work. There's nothing we can do until this is done. And then at the end of the day, we'll either come back today or we'll have to do it another day. And QED needs to give us, you know, let's talk about if they're going to give us a credit or how we're going to work this out. You know, it's like I get very practical. That's what I was going to say is you sound like you are... You're just looking at things in a very practical nuts and bolts way. This is the way it works. This is how we have to get through it. And it obviously you don't fly off the handle and become all frazzled like some people might. You must be very cool under that kind of pressure. Well, I think I'm just much more aggressive than I normally am. It's like, okay, you need to go upstairs and you need to call blah, blah, blah. And you need to do that. You know, it's, it's just more direct, more directive than uh, usually I'm, I'm like, well, let's see how this works out or, or uh, you know, I'm, I'm much more laid back and, and friendlier and kind, but I always feel like I'm being really mean, but I don't think I am. I'm just like, 
this is what we have to do. And you probably got some of that from the notion earlier on that when Fred Rogers said, you just get it done, right? Right. And he never said that to me, but I had so many people ask me what a producer does. And, you know, a producer can do a lot of, it depends on the project almost. At one point, the light bulb went on to me and it was like, well, you just make it happen. Just make it happen. I mean, Fred never said to me, get it done, but it was like, okay, I, I, I knew I had to get it done. <laughs> well, that's uh, it, that becomes quite clear and obvious when you're on a set and something's not working. It has to get done, so people start scrambling to make things work. I assume over time, you've not only received your fair share of notes from other executives, from people at WQED, from Fred Rogers, from publishers, and so on. I'm uh, asking you a question about note, re the receiving of notes, and you've probably given your share of notes to people. And when I say notes, I'm including critiques, criticism, and so on, not just actual physical notes. Do you have a philosophy about note giving and note taking? Well, I guess I don't, but I, I, I guess what I've learned over the years is if it's a, a negative note, I need to wait until I calm down before I give it, if I can. And that if there's some way to start on the positive and then say, you know, that that's a, a lot of, ex, a, a, a prime example is we used to have these production meetings and Fred would have an idea in his head of how it should look, but he couldn't draw it. And so somebody would come up with this and it was the ugliest thing you ever saw, or, you know, it just wasn't, it was, <laughs> you know, it's what that, that person created. So Fred would kind of, Mm, him and her around and say, well, I, I need it to be this or this, or he might not be able to say it exactly. So after the production meeting, I would say, you didn't like that, right? And he said, no, it, it, it needs to be this, it needs to be that. So then I would go to that person and I would say, you cannot show him that in that form. It needs to be much more done because he's just not getting it. Or I love the way this looks, but you know, he had an idea that this was going to be maybe a little bit more old fashioned. I just remember we did this piece where he actually ended up going snorkeling, but he had in his mind one of those big helmets that people who used to go, go dive down for sponges wore. Right. I don't know. If, and and it was like, Fred, they don't do that anymore. And he's like, well, oh, they don't. Like, I couldn't do that. And I said, no, you can't because they don't do that anymore. I said, what if you go snorkeling? And that was like, that was the, that's how I solved the problem. Because I had just gone snorkeling and I loved it. And so it was like one of those things. Oh, you might love this because you love to swim. And he had a great time. I, I couldn't bring him in. So what would you say was the biggest disaster that you ran into on that show that was like, how did you solve this? It was like, was it the Russia thing or was it something else? Well, the Russia thing was the most, it took me almost a year to put that together. I mean, not every day working on it, but that was the biggest challenge. You know, I'm talking about something that's just like, oh, something has collapsed, something has broken. How do you fix it? How, a, well, a big, big thing to get over. This was kind of big. We decided to do a piece at Williamsburg. So we're in the airport and we're in the U.S. Air Club. And I put the, the I put Fred's sweater and sneakers in this closet that was there because we were waiting to um waiting for the plane so when they called the plane we left we got on the plane without his sweater and sneakers oh. <laughs> so i realized that as they were shutting the door and i said to the attendant mr rogers sweater and sneakers are, are back in the u.s air club can't you open the door and i'll run and get them or somebody can you have somebody bring them out to me he said once it's closed it's closed and fred didn't know this was happening <laughs> so so I said to her, okay, once we take off, I got to talk to you. So I said to her, and she said, there's another flight in like, you know, a few hours from now into Roanoke. So we'll make sure it gets on the plane. I said, okay. And then I thought, I'll, do, I'll do, drop Fred off at Wilkinsburg. I'll go back to the, er, Williamsburg, not Wilkinsburg. I'll go back to the airport, pick it up. And there was a woman sitting maybe two or three seats back from me. And she was, she was watching this all unfold. And she said, and she said, Psst. she said, come back here. And I said, she said, I have to come back to the airport and I could drop, I could pick it up and drop it off for you. And I'm thinking, oh, Eureka, that's great. We're staying at the blah, blah, blah. We're staying at Williamsburg. So I'm sitting down and I, you know, I give her the address and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I don't remember, even remember her name now, but so 
we go to have dinner at the head of Williamsburg, who was a friend of Fred's. Um, it was a guy named Bob Wilburn, who used to be head of the Carnegie Museum here. So we're sitting there having dinner and his daughter's like 11 or 12 and she's like just learning to cook. And she's telling us all about everything we're eating and how she made it. And I'm like looking at my watch and thinking we gotta go to the back. So before dinner, I happened to call U.S. Air just to make sure that it was that it was happening. And we were staying in this old house on Williamsburg property. And the phones only had two outside lines. They were really for it, you know, within the park. So I can I said, you've got to give me this outside line. And, and this woman said, why? Uh, who are you? And I said, blah, 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 blah. And she said, okay, fine. So I I couldn't get through to Pittsburgh. Uh, U.S. Air. So I called the 800 number. So who knows where this woman was? And I said, look, I'm from Mr. Rogers' neighborhood and we need to get this sweater from Pittsburgh to uh, Roanoke. And I just need to make sure that it's happening. And she said, what? And I said, oh, we can't do that. And I said, look, this is Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. If we don't have a sweater, we can't tape, tape tomorrow. It's going to cost us a lot of money. And I couldn't believe I was so mad at her. <laughs> and she said, oh, OK, OK, Leah, let me I just hold on again. I'll make it work. So I talked to them. So then I went to dinner and I came back and I went to the desk and I said, so did somebody drop off a, you know, a sweater and sneakers? And he said, nah, I didn't see any sweater and sneakers. And I'm like, oh no, this woman took them. She's going to sell them. So I, but I get back to my room and I walk in and there in my bed are the sweaters and sneakers. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That, that was very, very fortunate. <laughs> yeah. I mean, she could have just been, you know, I could have fallen for it, but I thought, well, it's only port in the storm. The other thing I'll do is if they don't show up. I, I did think about calling somebody at the office and saying, get it to the, you know, just grab another sweater, grab a, a, a pair of sneakers, put them on a plane, drive them to here. I don't care. Just get them here. But you know, that was my backup plan. But um, thankfully, I didn't need to do it. Want to talk a little bit with you today about uh, your your various initiatives for reading for kids. You've been involved in both doing reading for kids and also running or participating in organizations that promote reading for children. First of all, I'm going to ask you an obvious question, but I would love to hear your take on it. Why is early childhood reading so important? It's important because the sooner you learn language, the more command you're going to have in almost everything you do. And so if parents can talk to their kids, even in utero, and then start talking to them and talking to them as they grow, they're going to learn the language and how to speak it. Then they're going to understand how it works and how magical it can be. So then if you read stories to them, again, you can talk to them while you're reading to them. You can, you know, they pick up those words. They make up their own stories. You know, imagination is part of executive function. And I mean, there's been studies done that children who do not have, who, who do not have the spoken word or who, not, who are not spoken to a lot when they're kids or read to show up at school with, with a vocabulary that's thousands and thousands of words less than these kids who've been read to talk to even, you know, you're in the grocery store. Look at that orange. See that orange? What is that? Is that an apple? That they're so far ahead. And these kids who haven't had that experience don't tend to catch up. And then, you know, le learning how to read helps you be successful in life, period. You know, if you can't if you can't read directions, you can't get anywhere. If you can't write and read and do an application, you can't get a good job. And there's so many wonderful stories out there that you can get lost in. All of the above. But for sure, there's lots of stories. And if you don't understand how to communicate via both speech and reading, you really are at a disadvantage. There's no, no doubt about that. So tell the listeners what First Experiences was, and let's talk about it. What were those books about? Okay. So we did. these were a series of books for parents and kids um, in which we photographed children and parents. So it wasn't drawings. It was real kids. And they were about things that you might take for granted, like going to the doctor for the first time is a scary thing for a kid. There's lots of things they, they need to know. Losing a pet, going on an airplane, going to the dentist, um, going to school. You know, those are just a few of them. But it, it's how to talk to 
to your kids about these things. And grownups don't really remember that a lot of times, if you tell kids what's going to happen, then it's much easier for them. It, it's not as scary. And that's that's what Fred was all about, was helping kids, again, negotiate the world. And that's what the two book series were about then. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just helping them ease into that and letting them know that people care about them and there are caring adults. The dentist cares about you. The doctor you know, wants to take care of you. Going to the potty, that was one of our big sellers. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, you know, what happens? Here's how people poop and, here, and here's what happens. And parents need, you know, nobody tells you how to be a parent. So, no, there's no really good books on parenting. I mean, there, there are books, but they're, you know, parents still learn how to be parents by being parents. Right. And so, you know, there's lots of, you can get a lot of good tips, but, you know, it's still... You know, there's still hurdles that you have to cross that, you know, no book's going to tell you. You just have to figure it out. But if you know somebody's out there to support you and you have something like, let's talk about going to the doctor, then you can talk to your kid about it. And it's not as scary. Were you taking Fred Rogers concepts from the show and bringing them into book form or were you coming up with brand new ideas? You no, know, a lot of these things he talked about on the show, I mean, almost all of them, you know, we, we did a piece about him going to the dentist. We did a piece about him getting a shot. Not that they they happen simultaneously, but we did a book about death and he talks about death on the show. We did a book about divorce, you know, so so that, that they're all things that are, it's just kind of Fred Rogers' gift to the world, his legacy in different forms. Well, it's interesting to me that uh, a lot of the topics that he covered, and then obviously you covered in the books as well, a lot of those topics, one would think of as sort of almost adult, but yet you're treating them for children to understand. Am I correct? You are correct. I mean, you know, there are things that kids wonder about, but you they may never really ask you about it. Some of it for a kid might feel taboo or they can't go there. And you're saying right. it's, it's okay to discuss it. We did a week about war, which... It doesn't air anymore, but when Fred first did the show in 1968, he did a week about war. That was the first episode. So, I mean, he was controversial. He was radical, as one of uh, the actors on the show said, um, because he, he wanted to tackle those things because he wanted kids to understand them and know that, you know, at least have some understanding of the truth. Is there or, anyone out there today doing anything like what he did? I don't know. I certainly don't know. I can't think of anyone. Yeah, I mean, certainly we try to do it through Daniel Tiger's neighborhood, but that's that's not that's not a real person. You that's, know, he was a real person looking right in the camera at you and telling you, "I can like you just the way you are." I've been speaking to Margie Whitmer for almost an hour now on uh, today's Story Beat. You've already told us a couple of really funny stories, but I'm wondering if you have a single story that you can share with us from uh, all of your experiences that was either offbeat, strange, quirky, or, or just plain funny? This is a little dated, so I'll tell you this one, but we can do another one too. Sure. When Fred wasn't Mr. Rogers, he often wore a suit with a red bow tie or a bow tie. Right. And, you know, he, had he, he would wear glasses because he wore glasses. And so I wasn't with him, but I heard this story when he got back from this trip. He walked off the plane. And this woman went up to him and said, I just love your popcorn. And Fred said, why, thank you. And he kept on walking. And of course, she was referring to Orville Redenbacher. <laughs> Orville Redenbacher, for listeners that may not know, was uh, a popcorn magnate. He sold yeah. a lot of popcorn and he wore a red bow tie. <laughs> and he did his own commercial. So that's how you knew it was him. It was his popcorn. <laughs> What other um, great stories can you tell us? My very first location shoot with Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood was at the National Zoo in uh, Washington. We, we were going to visit the pandas. And so I didn't realize, this was when Fred was just starting to get big. This was like in 1982 or something. And so we're breaking for lunch and we're outside and we're like in this picnic area. And Fred's sitting down to eat. And I remember all of these school kids came like running towards him. And I just remember, I didn't know how to be very tactful. And I said, hey, you got to let Mr. Rogers eat his lunch. And the teacher kind of, you know, took the kids away. And afterwards, the director said, I think you were a little mean to those kids. And I said, he has to eat lunch. We only have half an hour. He's tired. We were behind schedule anyway. 
And so I remember Fred said to somebody in the office, that shoot almost got out of control. <laughs> <laughs> you at that moment were not practicing Mr. Rogers. <laughs> well, I hadn't learned it yet, you know? <laughs> I think that that's a really valuable lesson. Is you learned that to be a producer for Mr. Rogers, you have to be a little bit more like Mr. Rogers, right? Right. When we would get new crew members, I would sit them down and I would say to them, look, you're going to tell people you work for Mr. Rogers. You just are because it's a fun title. But when you represent Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, so remember what you do in public, you know, that you represent him too, because they're going to, if you do something really stupid, it's going to be a reflection on us, not only on you, but on us. And I so, think, you know, I think Buddy was pretty well behaved there. We never found out about anything, what well, we did, but, you know, not very often. <laughs> but I just wanted to plant that in their brain, that, that they had a little bit of a responsibility because... Uh, they were representing somebody who was so honorable and respectful. Absolutely. So, all right, last question for you today, Margie. Do you have a solid piece of advice or a tip that you like to give people when they are starting out in the business or maybe they're in a little bit and trying to get to the next level? Um, when they say, how do you do what you do? How do I get into the business? Do, what kind of advice do you give folks? You know, I would always say, first of all, if you're interested in children's television, if you want to make a really good show, and there are a lot of shows out there, and there's a lot of shows that are not so great, and there are a lot of shows that are awful, <laughs> that, you know, don't enhance the child in any way. So I would say study child development and hang out with kids, you know, tutor, babysit, do whatever, but pay attention to kids and what they need. That, that's going to help you make a quality show that will last for a long time. Do anything, take any job you get, get, if it's getting coffee, if it's running errands, if it's, you know, I worked on Dawn of the Dead, I did makeup, you know, I, I mean, I just did, you know, I just got into it. And so just take any job you can get. And, and just remember that you may have a lot of book knowledge. You may have taken a lot of production courses, but you're going to learn so much, you know, on the set, hands-on stuff that you don't know everything. You're going to learn. You're going to learn a whole lot more. I don't want to say don't be cocky, but yeah, you may know all kinds of technical stuff, but everybody around you, not everybody, but a lot of people around you are going to teach you a lot and make you much better. So listen to them. And that goes back to the notion that you learn by doing it, not just by uh, getting an education in it, which is both valuable, but also nothing like actually doing it. That's right. Well, Margie Whitmer, this has been a fantastic hour on Storybeat today, and I cannot thank you enough for your time and your wisdom and sharing your great stories of uh, working with Fred Rogers and uh, others in the industry. So I appreciate you being on Storybeat with me today. Well, I appreciate you inviting me. I, I always like to or keep the legacy going, I guess I should say. I always like to keep the legacy going. And so we've come to the end of today's Story Beat. If you like this episode, won't you please take a moment to give us a comment, rating, or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great Story Beat episodes to you. StoryBeat is available on all major podcast apps and platforms, including Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, TuneIn, and many others. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, and may all your stories be unforgettable.